we're, we really are in the middle, right in the middle of a series about faith. We called the series Big Faith because we wanted to talk about it from the standpoint of what it would look like to have kind of big, bold, just audacious faith that kind of carried us through life. Um, and, and how do you measure faith, especially when you start talking about having big faith? What does that mean? What does it look like? How does God help it grow depending on where you are in your spiritual journey? And, and we did talk about this in the first week, and we're kind of setting everybody up for here's where we're, we're, what God tends to use. This is something I read years ago, and I kind of wrote it down, and it's been kind of my, on my map, that God tends to use these things to help us grow our faith exponentially. Uh, practical faith, meaning the, the stuff we put into practice, the things we believe we put into practice. Private disciplines, we talked about that last week, spiritual disciplines. Pivotal circumstances, uh, personal ministry, and provisional missions. So we're going to talk about that over the next part of the series. Um, but in order to figure that out in terms of what does big faith mean, we had to go to the definition of faith. And hopefully this is one of those verses you're going to put to memory. All right, you're going to put, put, lock it in here. This is from Hebrews 11, and this is what, how I believe God would define for us this idea of faith, because it's a word we use for everything, but his faith in terms of our faith to him. And I want you to read the yellow words out loud with me, all right? So now faith is what? Confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see, right? So it's really interesting because sometimes we use the word faith to talk about belief, and that's true. And we use the word faith to talk about trust in God, which is true, but it's interesting the way Hebrews describes and defines faith as the results of what we believe and the results of how we trust. And we told you the first week, you know, we don't measure faith like, like, a, like a fluid in a, in a jar, right? Like we don't, me- big faith is not you have more and more and more faith than this person and that person. Faith has everything to do with the object of our faith, Right? object of our faith is what really defines our, our measure of faith, is the object of faith. And so when we talked about this, it's like, well, it's, it's the object of our faith um, that really helps us really narrow in, and then we begin to see growth in confidence and assurance. So here's the bottom line. We've hit the last few weeks that when our faith in action, meaning not just what we believe up here, cerebral, but we're actually living it out, practical, it intersects with God's faithfulness, because this is how God designed things, this is how he created things, then our faith grows. What grows, right? Well, our confidence grows. What we believe, we become more confident in, right? What we trust in, our assurance grows. So that's kind of how this idea of faith growing in our life, you'll grow in confidence and assurance. So this is one of the ones that most people don't enjoy talking about, not that I do, but it's just one of those I know is such a huge deal in our faith. And that's the one we're going to talk about this week, which is pivotal circumstances. You, can, you really can't go very far in a conversation with somebody, maybe you knew, family member, people you're meeting for the first time, and if you start talking about your faith journey or what God's doing in your life or you share things with them or they share things with you, at some point, you're probably, if you have enough time, <laughs> you'll be given uh, probably one or two examples of pivotal circumstances that have happened in their life that God somehow used to help grow their faith. You're going to hear and pick up on those things. And it doesn't, don't hear the piv- word pivotal as negative. Pivotal circumstances can be anything. Going on a mission trip, like the first mission trip I ever did, you know, was pivotal in my life. It changed me uh, for what we did. And then I got to go to Peru with Kelly. And, you know, it was just every experience has been so cool. And what I mean by pivotal could be babies. It could be adoption. It could be, uh, uh, you know, pregnancies, adoption. It could be new jobs. It could be a move, right? It could be a big move for your family. These are pivotal circumstances that can really, I mean, just bless you in such a way that it really does kind of change things. It kind of pivots in terms of the direction of your life. And so the same thing is true, though, obviously with negative pivotal circumstances. And they tend to be the ones we focus on more. Why? Well, psychology, there's a ton of reasons why we love to commiserate about what's wrong with life (laughs) versus what's right about life. There's a lot of reasons for that, right? But it tends to be the things that we focus on more, you know, when the move didn't work out, you know, when the new job failed, when the, you know, when these tragedies, sometimes tragedy happens, and these are pivotal things that either move us closer to God or move us away from God. That tends to be the movement that you see happening within the context of these pivotal things. And I was, you know, again, there's lots of reasons why negative kind of outshines the positive, but here's a great quote from C.S. Lewis that I love. 
God whispers to us in our pleasures, or in pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. This comes from his book, The Problem with Pain. This is one of those where it's like, yeah, again, we get it. He's still speaking. He still speaks. He still whispers. He still does. But it's the, it's the painful, pivotal experiences sometimes that seem to get the most attention because it grabs our attention and because it gets others' attention as well. So I want to, before we dive in today, I want to talk about these, uh, this idea of moving away from God or towards God around in terms of how, what it looks like in terms of our faith and what can oftentimes happen, and I don't know if you've heard these phrases used or not, but, uh, you know, especially when it's bad circumstances, okay, you have somebody dying of an illness, you know, somebody in your life is close to you and they're dying of an illness and you're praying for them and, and you know, people around you kind of on the outside looking in, they look at your faith and it's kind of like, you know, what are you doing? Like you believe in this invisible God, you know, that's supposed, supposed to magically do something, you know, like you're not even trusting the science really that tells you inevitably what's going to happen. It's, you know, you're praying for some miracle, so to speak, and you believe those things happen. And you know, on the outside looking in, sometimes people will use words like it's, well, it's a childish faith. Or you've maybe you heard the word blind faith, right? It's just a blind faith. You have nothing to base this on. It's a childish faith. It's, it's, it's like a child. And it's interesting the way they would use that phrase because actually in Scripture, we read this the first week, God really does kind of encourage us to come to him like a child. He actually tells us that, you know, those with the faith of a child you know, we'll seek him and above all else. And actually, that's part of how he kind of views us. And it's a lot of the New Testament language about our heavenly father and things like that. So it's an interesting thing to, to, to think through. But I want to just give you the, the, the kind of the big worldview perspective of childish faith versus childlike faith. Because it really is different. And it, and it really does change whether we're going to move closer to God through pivotal circumstances or further away. So childish faith looks like this. It's very man-centered, it's very kind of destiny-driven, and my destiny, and my, you hear people use these phrases a lot, and my destiny, my purpose, those kind of things. It's, very, it's all about kind of who we are and what our purpose is here on earth. It's outcome-oriented, meaning that it really does d- depend on the outcome based on where, where I'm going to put my faith, and it's self-serving because it tends to all be about me, you know, like the circumstances happen, but... It's all about me and why me. That's often the the question that gets asked is why me. So the childish faith says, well, I must have answers in order to trust you. And I must get my way in order to follow you. Right? Like I I have to kind of know how this is going to shake out if I'm going to claim to follow you. I have to have the answers first. God, you have to tell me which direction first before I take the step. You have to tell me these things before I can you know, know for sure. Childlike faith, as opposed to childish faith, childlike faith is God-centered, right? Childlike faith, or sorry, yeah, childlike faith is God-centered, meaning it's about, it's about something greater than just our fate or destiny, if you will. Purpose-driven, meaning that there, there might be more purpose to this than just my circumstances. It might be more purpose to this than just what I'm experiencing. And then kingdom focus, meaning that there might actually be, it's not just a why me, it's a, it's a, okay, why is this happening, God? What is it you're wanting me to learn from this? What is this, what is it doing for the kingdom? What is it doing for your glory? Like what, what's the bigger play here? It says, childlike faith says, I'll trust you even without the answers. And I'll follow you even if I don't like the outcome. Well, that's huge. Even just those two statements, that's a huge difference in terms of the faith we bring into a pivotal circumstances. So the reason I say it this way is I want you to understand there's, there's three kind of ways to look at this. One is you can make, you, you're called to really make the decision ahead of time what kind of faith you have. You know, is it, is it the kind that says I need the answers before I'm going to trust you or I'm going to trust you no matter what? You have to pre-decide that. Or it's in the middle of your circumstances when you're asking all the why me questions and uh, that you can start to move towards a childlike faith and understand that there might be something greater going on. There might be something this and God, I'm going to choose to trust you even though I don't see the outcome. Or it's after you've been through a pivotal circumstance that you look back on and you can see, wow, my faith was so childish there. 
Or what did I learn from this that helps me grow in confidence and assurance? Or you can look back on pivotal circumstances and circumstances. Well, I didn't grow in confidence and assurance at all. I grew in fear. I grew in insecurity. I grew in isolation. I grew in depression. Does that, does that make sense? Everybody with me? It's, it's either moving us towards him where we grow in confidence and assurance or it's moving us away from him. And again, this is how, this is just to give you an example of how this looks, because we'll read through these things really fast and not really think through what's being said. James, the brother of Jesus, okay, he writes this down for the church. He writes it down for the church to hear and to listen. And he says it this way, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great, what's the word? Yeah, okay, I'm going to say it one more time. All right, here we go. Go back. Because they weren't paying attention. Let's go back to that. All right. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great what? Yeah, that's the pre-decision time, right? That when, that when trouble comes my way, I'm going to view it as an opportunity for joy. Next verse. You know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to what? Grow. Grow. Right? So I can be in the middle of a pivotal circumstance, and I know that if I let it play out, if I let it continue, if the endurance, it's endurance that's building as it tests my faith, and it's going to help grow my faith. And then at the end, he says, let it grow, <laughs> for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, you play this two ways. One could be perfect and complete because once you get to that certain point where you have completed all the growth you needed, God's going to probably take you home, right? Or just understanding that perfect and complete, needing nothing, and I love that needing nothing thing because the more you grow in confidence and assurance, the less you need the crutches around you to help hold you up. I don't, don't think that is self-confidence. It's not self-confidence. It's confidence in Christ, but you don't need as many crutches to kind of hold you up because you are growing in confidence and assurance and you need less and less and less provoking and poking and prompting to get yourself, your mind and everything back on track. So there, there's these three things, pre-deciding, deciding in the moment and, and really seeing the results of that help us really kind of define that childish faith versus the childlike faith that we're going to walk through in our pivotal circumstances. Now, I'm going to walk you through one example today. It's going to take a little bit of time. I'm going to look through the Gospel of John. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, it's John 11. I'm not going to read every single verse, but I am going to read a lot of it, okay? And it's primarily because this is a pretty well-known story, and we think the point of the story is usually not the point of the story at all. Just let you know in advance. We miss the point of the story. We miss the reason the story is told, Okay? And, and this particular example has a lot of, I mean, Jesus and, and Lazarus and Martha and Mary, and there's lots of people involved in this, and the story is so much bigger than sometimes we give it credit, especially when it comes to learning about these pivotal circumstances and how it works to grow our faith. So, again, let's walk through it. Um, again, I'll, I'll stop at a few different points and kind of share some insights, but let's start here, Okay. Um, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. All right. This is the Mary who later poured expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus, telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. I love the NIV actually says, the, the one whom you, who you love is sick. The King James says the one whom you love is sick, is very ill. And, and, and I love the description of that because it just lets us understand Jesus from the standpoint of it wasn't just his 12 disciples. I mean, Jesus had close personal family and friends that he was connected to in his life here on earth in his ministry. And here, a very close friend, as we see, they, Mary and Martha, they're the famous ones, right? Like they, you know, we've read passages where Mary's at at Jesus' feet, and Martha's busy cooking in the kitchen, and she gets all upset and fusses with her sister about it. You know, that's a fun, that's a fun one to, to read. He, he, he references later on, oh, yeah, she's the one who puts the perfume on my feet and, you know, kind of 
represents the burial and, talk, you know, kind of foreshadows what's going to be happening. And so uh, Jesus, you know, they're, they're fair, pretty famous. We hear of Lazarus as basically the brother, but he probably, based on his wealth, would have been somebody who helped support Jesus' ministry. He would have been, I mean, they said several times he, they had dinner and the, he invited them into their home uh, there in Bethany. All right, so this is a pretty big deal. So they send him the note. Hey, you know, take, read, the, read in between the lines to know that they're basically saying, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. The one you love is sick. Come quick, right? Hurry. Everybody have that tone? Everybody who's married knows that tone, right? Yeah, there's a problem. What they said was, there's a problem. Come quick, right? Like, there's a problem. You got to fix it. So this is the tone in which they send this message. Now, here's what Jesus does. Jesus heard about it. And said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, the disciples heard this, and they would have heard Jesus say these words before. So they're like, oh, cool. But although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. So although he loved them, and he told them this weird thing, like, oh, it's not going to end in death, don't worry about it. It's just, this is all happening for a reason. They're like, okay, Jesus, we trust you. But he decides to not do anything. And he stays there a couple of days. Now, the problem with this is that it kind of bleeds into Jesus is not responding the way Mary and Martha would have probably wanted him to respond based on the news that he got. And you and I are never guilty of that, right? Like we've told God the deadline's at 5 p.m., right? It's the end of the month, Lord, Like, there are things in our life where we oftentimes reach out to him with a lot of time, you know, tone in our hearts that it's like, it it sort of needs to happen. If it's going to happen, God, it needs to happen now. And God sometimes doesn't respond the way we would. Part of the reason we have such a screwed up mess, uh, screwed up view of God is we compare God to ourselves all the time. Well, God, I would have rushed to help Lazarus. Why wouldn't you? do that. Does that make sense? Like we just, we get a very, very weird sense of who God is based on who, how we would respond or how we would act or react, if you will. So Jesus doesn't do anything right away. And so two days later, or for two days, he doesn't go. Mary and Martha have to watch their brother die. And they take turns probably at the edge of the city, waiting for Jesus to come, waiting to get word back that Jesus was coming and waiting on basically him to do what he had already done so many times before. He healed the leper. He, 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 you know, he, he healed children. He, he caused blinded eyes to see. Like, these are miracles they would have been witnesses to. There wasn't any reason for them to, ex- to not expect Jesus to show up and heal his friend, the one whom he loves. Back into Jesus' life, eleven seven, it says that finally he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. He says, let's go. Now the disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Disciples love to remind Jesus of what he doesn't know. Hey, Jesus, remember that time? It was just two days ago where they threatened to stone you. That means kill you and us. Okay, so remember, it's still about us. They're going to stone you, Jesus, and us, probably. Are you sure you want to go back there? Are you, are you sure, Jesus? I can only imagine they thought of the time that the Roman centurion came and, 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 and they witnessed Jesus say, wow, what incredible faith. And, and then he healed the guy's servant like wirelessly. Didn't even need to go to the house. Just said, and so I can only imagine the disciples were like, let's do one of those again. Like that was great. You know, can't we just do that? Judea is not a good place to go right now. But, you know, Jesus said, no, we're, we're going. Here's how he follows it up, verse 11. He says to them, he actually teaches them a little lesson about time, and we're not going to go into that. But in verse 11, he says, look, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I'm going to go wake him up. Okay, cool. The disciples respond the same way we would. Lord, if he's sleeping, he will soon get better. Right? Like sleep's the best medicine, guys. Let's, let's let him sleep. So verse 13, they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus was dead. So I love how way he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I love this phrase though. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. 
for now, you will really believe. So come, let's go see him. I just love that, that piece where he says, yes, no, guys, I'm sorry. I know, I know what I said, that it wasn't going to end in death. And I know I said he's sleeping, but you guys aren't getting any of this, these clues. Guys, Lazarus is dead. Okay, he, he's dead. And he said, and you need to be thankful that I wasn't there. It's actually good that I wasn't there because I believe, again, this is, there's a few times, especially now John's the master at this because John doesn't write chronologically like a story. He has themes that he kind of, but this is oftentimes the way John likes to tip the hat, so to speak, of Jesus' humanity, okay? He likes to kind of, kind of help us see and experience not just who Jesus was as his divinity, he, although he does that, he helps us see his humanity. He helps us see that Jesus felt things. He wasn't just a caring God who didn't feel anything. He was a caring God in, the, in, a, in a form of a man who felt everything. And so he tips his hat and kind of shares, hey, it's good for you I wasn't there. What does that mean? I would have healed him. Like, you know, like there's a, there's a bigger plan at stake and man, you better be glad I wasn't there because I would have not probably wanted to see my friend suffer the way he needed to suffer and die. Amazing. Well, again, they go on. Thomas, Thomas basically says, all right, let's see. He kind of pulls an Eeyore. Let's go with Jesus and get killed and stoned. You know, let's, let's go. If we're going to, if this is going to happen, if we're going to end it all, let's just go. Let's just go end it with Jesus. And then they show up, and it's been four days. It's significant because four days, it would have been past the three-day wake, their ritual as a Jewish custom. It would have been past the three-day wake. The fourth day would have been the time probably the most people were there. They would have probably been traveling and coming in during the wake itself. And by the fourth day, which is usually when the funeral services kind of ended, because it was, you know, it's past the wake, and they were able to kind of have their closure, fourth day would have been when the majority of people were already there to see Lazarus and see Mary and Martha. So it says that he showed up and Martha rushes out to meet him, Rush, rushes out to see him. And she says, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. This is a very natural thing for Martha to say and to feel. Jesus, we sent word. You, you didn't come. You didn't come fast enough. You, you weren't here. If you would have been here, like we play this game, and I, and I don't mean to, I'm, but trust me, when I give examples today, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out. These are just just broad examples of, I know, very pivotal circumstances that happen to a lot of people. And so it tends to happen this way when when we want to help, we're trying to help God, but it's really just help ourselves. We sort of categorize for ourselves why things are happening, especially when they're bad, right? Why things are happening. But it leads us into like a just not circular nonsense, right? Because we start asking questions that there is no end answer to. All right? Well, did God, let, let me just play the game. You guys ready? Okay. Did Lazarus, uh, well, sorry, let me rephrase this. Is it Jesus' fault that Lazarus died? Anyone want to venture a guess? No, right? Okay. If Jesus could have healed him and chose not to go, is it Jesus' fault Lazarus is dead? Are we less sure? Right? Why? Because this is what we do. Right? Well, that wasn't in, cancer wasn't in God's control, but he could have let the treatment work. That drunk driver that came out of nowhere, well, I, God didn't cause that, but he probably could have, you know, I prayed for a hedge of protection. Right? I prayed for traveling mercies. I, you know, God, maybe God didn't cause it. And I'm telling you, I grew up with all this. I grew up with his perfect will and his permissive will. And did God allow these things? Did God allow this to happen for a greater thing? And I'm just telling you, yes, I can theologically 
track, you know, track down every single one of those things. But I'm telling you, it's a cul-de-sac of just ignorance when we go circle, circle, circle. God, did you allow it? Did you allow it? Is it your fault? Is it not your fault? Who to blame? What are we doing? We're thinking we're helping God. And, and the reality is, is that we're grieving. We're all going to grieve loss. That's just the way it is. We're going to grieve any loss, and it's part of that pivotal, pivotal circumstance, but it's not about the circumstance, it's about how we are responding to it. That really is what God is working on. Not just the, the circumstance itself. We can't change death. We can't change what happened. We can't change even what God plans to happen. But we we do control how we respond to it because that's what it's about. That's really what faith, in terms of us talking about this childish faith or childlike faith, is really all about, is how are we responding to it. So, Jesus, if you would have been there, you wouldn't have died. That's very natural for her to feel that way, very natural for her to say that. She goes on to say this. She says, but even now, God, or even now, God, I know, God's going to give you whatever you ask for. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. I love Martha's response. Yes, Martha said, he will rise again when everyone else rises on the last day. All right, the, this, just, just take a moment to picture this. This isn't bad. This is just what we all do. Okay? All of us do this. When we face the unexplainable, we'll reach into our little theological basket and pull anything out that will give us hope. You know? Have you ever seen people do this in the middle of very usually tragic things and they're reaching back there and they pull out a, all things work together for good for those who love God. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is all I have. I can't explain anything. This is all I have. This is what Martha's doing. Martha's like, yeah, Jesus, we read it at the funeral. We're good Jewish people. We know. We're all going to rise up on the last day. Right, Dan? That's, where we're, that's, that's the ecclesial, ecclesial church. We're all going to rise up. That's going to happen. He's like, yeah, Jesus, I know. Thanks for giving me a sliver of hope. <laughs> that's not, of course, what Jesus meant. But this is what we do, right? We, we will reach for anything we can. Again, not just to answer it away or justify it. We will reach for even those theological things that bring us some aspect of hope through the circumstance. So here's Jesus again. He said, no, I, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Now, sometimes we pull this verse out of context, but John, John gives a lot of his stuff in context for a reason, so that we won't really lo lose it. He's looking at Martha, grieving Martha, who's had to watch her brother die and is now going through the, to the fourth day. The wake is over. The miracle of suddenly coming back to life or, you know, what they used to call dead sleep or things like that, that's over. By the fourth day, it's usually done. All hope was gone with the exception of, yeah, he's going to rise up. He says, no, I, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Even those who die are going to live. He says it again. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe that? Now, I love this because Martha not only says yes because she's answering Jesus, but I love that Martha just sort of gets in there and grounds herself in what she knows is true. She does not know why her brother died. She does not know what's getting ready to happen. She does not know anything else, but she says, yes, Lord, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one who's come into the world from God. You know? Like, I, I'm going to let you know I am rooted, I have confidence and assurance in those things. I don't know what's your plan but I know that. So yes, Jesus, I believe you. So then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Why is Mary still there? Well, you know, Mary was the empathetic one. Mary was the one that's sitting at Jesus' feet. Mary's the one who had all the feelings for everyone. You guys know anyone like that in your life? Yes? You know, you, you, seriously, do you know anyone like that? They're the empath, you know, they're 
So where was Mary going to be? With all the feelers and all the crying and all the people and all the, the things. That's where Mary was going to be. Martha was out getting things done, solving problems, and talking to Jesus. But now Mary has to come out. And Jesus stayed outside the village at the place where Mary, where Martha had met him. Now I love this. When the people who, who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. But then Mary arrived and saw Jesus and fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Same statement. That was, that was the grief in, the, in their heart. Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her and a deep anger welled within him. And he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? They asked, or he asked them. And they told him, Lord, come and see. So then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. See how much he loved Lazarus. But some said, this is where the skeptics come in. Look, this man healed a blind man. Could he, not, he, could he have not kept Lazarus from dying? Could you imagine Mary and Martha having to defend Jesus to people? Like taking turns at the end of the city. Well, why isn't, don't you guys know Jesus? The one who like made the blind see? Yeah, yeah. Isn't he really good friends of yours? Don't you like know him? Like by his first name? Yeah. We, we, we called him out. You know, we called and told him. Well, where is he? I don't know. Traffic's bad. I don't, you know, like, could you imagine them trying to defend even after Lazarus died, could you imagine them trying to defend the fact that, yeah, I know, I feel the same way. If Jesus would have been here, he wouldn't have died, but he wasn't here, and so he's dead. I mean, just don't remove yourself from this story. This is the story. And I love, again, that John kind of shows us the emotion of Jesus. You know, what are the five stages of grief? Anger, denial, you know, sadness, like... They're all there, right? He's, he's grieving. He allows himself to grieve. He, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 4 tells us again that Jesus became our high priest. He fulfilled everything that needed to be done. And as a high priest, he was able not only to fulfill that role because of his function, but he said he felt everything we felt. You now have a high priest who understands what loss feels like what grief feels like, what these painful things feel like. You have a high priest, you have a Jesus that now has fulfilled all those roles, and he is the one who does that for you. So he, he weeps, he, he's angry about death, that's true. He's angry about the, what, what had to happen. And then it goes on to say, because um, he pauses in this moment, but again, he, he arrives angry at the tomb, so he's still angry. The cave is, is a stone with a, a stone rolled across the entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, it's been, he's been dead four days. The smell will be terrible. Remember I talked about, remember in King James Version? Lord, he stinketh is what it says in the King James. Okay? But Lord, he stinketh. That's true. Jesus responds, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? Just hold on to the fact that I'm here. So they rolled the stone away. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people. Okay, he's, once again, it really doesn't have to do with Jesus. It has to do with who's there. I'm saying it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. King James, come forth, right? And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound in graves clothes. His face was wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. I'm telling you, what a joyous time of celebration this would have been. What an incredible moment. Again, talking about a pivotal circumstance, this pivotal circumstance has just ended Exactly the way Jesus said it would. It's not going to end in death. Remember, that's what he said specifically to the disciples. It's not going to end there, although death was going to be a part of it. It wasn't going to end there. 
and everybody should rejoice. And, and they did. But then it introduces another pivotal circumstance. And now again, the context matters. John doesn't write chronologically. So just understand the context of this story and where it happens in Jesus' story. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus. Yes, when they saw this happen, this undeniable miracle. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And it goes on to say that now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had been more than frustrated by Jesus, it goes on to say, so from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. He must die. And as a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness, to the village of Ephraim, and stayed there with his disciples. Was it not an incredible, great miracle that Lazarus was raised from the dead? Absolutely. It also stopped Jesus' public ministry. It also put him, not just having to be weary of, 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 of the teachers and the, the r- religious leaders, but now he had to, like, escape from them, hide from them, because this was now going to end and move him into his final stage of his life. So just, just see, like, they're, they're not disconnected. They're connected. One circumstance right into the other. Now, okay, so let me go back to the thing where I said it earlier. This story is not given to us necessarily because the story is about Lazarus. Everybody with me? I mean, I hope you are, because listen, what did Lazarus do? Nothing. What did Lazarus do? He died. We're all going to die. Right? Like, he, he got sick and died. That's as natural as life gets. Did he raise himself from the dead? No. He got woke up like he was sleeping. Is everybody with me? You don't, you don't look at somebody who just woke up and be like, you're amazing. You know, like, you don't do that. Yeah, he woke up and was like, they took the headband off and he's like, Jesus, what's going on? Where have you been? I don't remember. I, was, I took a good nap, but I've been, it's been a while. I was waiting on you. This isn't a story about Lazarus. Yes, Lazarus is the circumstance. It's the pivotal thing. But the story is about Mary and Martha and how they responded to Jesus. The story is about everybody else who showed up at the the funeral. That Jesus was allowing them to be partakers in this unbelievable moment, this miracle, this undeniable moment of faith to come to him. So that God's glory would be seen. That's what the story is about. The story is about Jesus allowing himself to go through the pain and loss of losing a friend. It's not, it's not about, I mean, again, Lazarus, yay. But it's like, it's not about Lazarus. Lazarus was just the one being used in the moment. Like, it was, it was his life and death that was being used to do all of these Things And I think sometimes when we go to pray, especially when we're responding in faith and we're trying to work out these pivotal circumstances, we spend so much time zeroing in on the circumstance itself when the circumstance isn't the issue. It's our response to it. Death and loss are going to happen. That's not the problem. How we respond to it is. Illness, cancer, you know, you know lifelong disease, those happen. It's how we respond to to it. Jobs loss happens. Divorces happen. It is not the circumstance that we need to constantly circle ourselves around with childish faith, kind of doing our own little faith tantrum. Well, God, it's not fair. Why me? I don't like it. Because it's not about the circumstance. It's about our response to it. And I'm telling you, we're either growing towards him, we're either moving towards him and we're growing in confidence and assurance because of our response to this, or we are growing in fear and we are growing in insecurity and we are growing in doubt and we are growing in isolation and all the other things that the enemy rejoices in because we think it's about the circumstance and we lose sight of the fact that it's about our response to it. Here's, uh, here's a quick, um, this is our read-along in Hebrews. Because we believe, again, this is just us, 
we kind of feel like, well, whatever the circumstances should kind of determine our response to it. But that's just not what we see in Scripture. So let's go to Hebrews 11 again. Hebrews 11 starts with a definition of faith. It goes on to give kind of a little highlight role of several people in the Old Testament and their faith and what God did and didn't do through them. And you ever get into those moments where you're like, I don't know, you're giving a toast or you're at a wedding or, you know, whatever, and you start naming people, and then you realize you're going to forget a whole bunch of people, so you're really upset that you started naming people? Everybody ever feel like that? Well, the author of Hebrews has named a whole bunch of people, but he can't name everybody. So here in verse 32 is how he does it. Oh, how much more do I need to even say about this in terms of faith? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jopheth and David and Samuel and all of the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice. They received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the flames of fire. They escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle. They put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. But others were tortured, refusing to trust, or sorry, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. So some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All of these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. How do you respond to pivotal circumstances? Most of us would say, and this is the way Christians are living, depends on what those circumstances are. Depends on where they are, right? Right? And there's too many churches with too many preachers preaching the first half of this list in terms of trying to help people respond in their life. And woo, you're gonna you're gonna set armies to flight. You're gonna you're gonna shut the mouths of lions. That's what God has in store for you. And everybody's like, yeah. Nobody's gonna listen to me go, whoo, some of you are gonna be sawed in half, and you're gonna live in caves for the rest of your life, and you're gonna be, you know, oppressed and that's the worst. Nobody's coming back tomorrow and next week, you know. And yet we still live our lives as if the outcome determines our response to God. When are we going to get it? How many stories do you have to read? How many of your own pivotal circumstances do you have to walk through? And realize that the childish faith doesn't get you anywhere. It moves you further and further and further away from the one we should be running to. Convinced in this weird, modern Christian, Western blessing of God for his people ideal that we should only be on the front half of that list. And never have to experience the back half. Here's how Paul says it. And I'll close with this. Here's how Paul says it. Right? Paul Paul gives it to us in Romans 8. It's very similar. I just love the way he words it. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? We would all be like, no. Right. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble? Trouble of any kind? Calamity? Persecuted? Hungry? destitute, in danger, or threatened with death? With death? What's the answer? Yes. That's exactly what it means. You must have sinned horribly or are not obeying him in some area of your life or you simply do not have enough faith. If you can't tell, that's my version of what it says. That's, that's, you never know what I'm going to put up here. That's why you have to have your own Bible. That's the MDV version. That is where most Christians in America 
are going are gonna to say the right thing. Does it mean he doesn't love us? No, of course not. But we're going to live in such a way that every time it happens, we are going to push further and further away from him and grow in fear and insecurity and depression and anxiety because we actually believe that, yes, it does matter. You've probably got some sin in your life you haven't confessed. You probably made a horrible mistake. It's probably your fault. You might just not have enough faith. God's punishing you. Here's what it actually says, by the way. Don't pay attention to my verse. Does it mean that? No. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Right? That last song we sang, the victory in the name of Jesus and the resurrected life that belongs to us. Like, there's so much power there. And here's Paul. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, not death or life. Well, how would life separate us from, from God's love? Well, because we get, a lot, we get really distracted from, in life. Not just the bad things. Angels or demons. Well, why would, we, why would that pull us away? Because we might get a little too, we might become and make those things our idol. And it still pulls us away from God. Neither fears for today, nor the worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And then he closes out with the, with the clincher. No power in sky above or earth below, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate, separate us from the love of God that is revealed through Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, bottom line, I'll close this out. This isn't, this isn't a you better have childlike faith and not childish faith message. This is a pivotal circumstances are either coming your way, you're in it right now, or you're on the backside of it and you have the opportunity to reflect and see where you are. You can pre-decide, man, trouble of any kind. I'm going to count it an opportunity for joy. Doesn't mean you don't struggle. Doesn't mean you don't grieve. Doesn't mean you don't have the losses. Don't, don't, don't ignore. It's not ignoring life. It's just pre-deciding. I'm going to trust in God no matter what. It's in the middle of your pivotal circumstances when you're just swimming in that cul-de-sac and you're just like, dude, I, I don't even know which way is up. And then you do what, Mar what Mary does and you reaffirm what you know. God, I know you're faithful. I know nothing can separate me from you. Or you're on the backside, and I'm telling you, that verse in James, the endurance is going to pay off. The endurance is going to pay off. Just continue to approach him with a childlike faith. God, what is the kingdom purpose? What are you wanting to teach me? What is it you're wanting to use me for? Burn me up. Set me on fire for the whole world to see. What kind of faith do we bring into our pivotal circumstances? Because it's not a question of whether you're going to have them. It's never a question about the circumstances. I don't know what they are. The questions are how we're going to respond in terms of how God's going to help use that to grow us in our faith and our confidence and assurance of him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. And I... I don't know what else to pray other than, God, it's only by your Holy Spirit that we can come to you as Abba, Father. It's by the gift of your Spirit that we can draw close to you, that we can lean in instead of leaning away in our own flesh. But God, I'm just praying for all of us here that we would be moving towards you in that childlike faith so that you can continue to let it grow strengthen us in confidence and assurance. God, may we, may we just confess or repent of where our childish faith has pulled us away from you. There are circumstances that we can think about where we are further away from you because of how we responded in that moment. God, just convict us. and Give us that grace to be able to approach you again, to move closer again, so you can continue to grow us into the big faith you have for us. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.